I uh, haven't had anybody show up yet. It's a little bit past um, starting time here. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and, and uh, maybe say a few things about assignment two, and I'll post this as usual um, for anybody to watch after the fact. So um, I expect everybody has their dev box up by this point. So, I mean, if you don't, you know, you really need to be getting with me, you know, ask for um, an appointment, you know, if you need it, we can zoom it, uh, get it set up, that kind of thing. So, all right, let's uh, get started here. Um, so usually on these assignments, um, I am, um, um, I mean, usually on these help sessions, I, I go over the assignments mostly, right? So this week, you know, we're working on the uh, structures and classes uh, materials. Um, and um, so there's a couple of videos as usual. And the assignment this week, we're going to be building and adding a new data type to the language uh, using C++ classes, okay? So this is the first week of materials that I wouldn't expect that maybe in, uh, you know, so maybe you touched a little bit about using classes in your programming two course, but uh, maybe not, right? So, so we're, we're talking basically about the beginnings of object-oriented programming um, in this unit here this week, all right? So let me think. So uh, a couple of things. Um, um, oh, I, I wanted to mention about the um, the examples repository. Um, so all, all these uh, videos that I have here, uh, the video lectures for the class, uh, I usually have source code that I'm going through, and and you know I encourage you, you know, not just to watch the videos, but to actually go through the source code and modify it while while you're watching that. So um, this is described. Um, in the additional uh, resources, I believe. Um, so, um, so there's a uh, another repository called the uh, the Git Letter Examples here. I, we, we can look at that if we want to. So let's open up that repository. But. Um, but uh, more directly, you can um, um, clone this repository and actually uh, run the examples in there. All right. So, um, we'll bring the repository up first. So you clone this as usual. Um, oh, I, I probably don't have my dev box up and running. So I also wanted to make certain, you know, I show that again, just to, to, to get everybody used to doing these procedures for running things. So, so I need to get my dev box up before I can get into it and clone it and things. So let me change into, um, I've got all my boxes in the boxes directory. Yours are probably in repos. All right. So just change into that um, on your um, terminal. And do a vagrant up should boot your virtual machine up. Well, keep an eye out for that uh, you're forwarding the port 8080 like we expect, and that your shared folders get mounted here, and that you don't get any other errors. So. So it's not actually completely booted until you get your prompt back. Okay, so now we've got our prompt back. So I should be able to access my, um, my uh, Visual Studio Code uh, dev box. So let's go back to um, uh, cloning this lecture examples here. So uh, as usual, I get the repository open. I'll copy the URL. Paste it in there, and I'll go ahead and put it into my sync assignments as usual. So here you'll find that there's just a bunch of uh, source files. Um, so here we're on unit two on like structures and classes and things. So you know if you're watching the video on. Um, um, 
starting off on unit two one structures, you know, you can open up the code um, and look and look through it and follow through it uh, while you're watching the videos. Um, I believe if you do, you know, so it's got the normal make, um, make clean and make on here. So, so I believe you can do a control shift one or from a terminal. Uh, oh, um, yeah, you'd have to configure the, the this as usual, um, I believe. So, um, yeah, there's a configuration. So we first have to uh, get into a terminal and configure. Um, oops. There we go. And we should be able to make. So here, if you do a make, it'll actually build uh, all of these files here um, and, and create executables for you. So. And if you want to run these, you have to actually run them by hand. So they'll be in a directory called bin. So if you look in bin, you'll see all these directories. So for example, let's say you're following along in the video for the, uh, the structures. Um, and um, let's say that, let's, let's make a change. Um, so the very first line of output on the structure, let's say, I'll add some text here. Right, that. So, so if you modify that, and if you rebuild, so if you do Control Shift Two to do a make, uh, again, so the way the make is set up, it should only rebuild the, the file that you're modifying. So, so we rebuilt the uh, the unit uh, unit two video one structures, and then you can run that from a term from your terminal. So, um, if you open up your terminal into the lecture examples here, uh, you have to the way to run this is you have to do dot slash bin. And then the, the name of the, the the file that you want to run. So in this case, it's unit zero two dash one um, is the the name of the executable that'll be created here for this particular example. So, so um, you can see that um, you know. So it, it actually compiled and, and made did my changes in here, right? So or for example, you know, as you're watching through the, the structure video, if I if I changed um, say the address of the house in my first structure or so. To put it on Bogart Street or something like that. Save it, Control Shift 2 to rebuild that file. And then go back to my terminal and we can run it. So, so, you know, again, I encourage you, you know, not to just watch the, the lecture videos, but to actually follow along in the code, try things out yourself, you know, that kind of thing. So, um, okay, had a few people join me finally. So let me know if you can hear me uh, here. Okay. So I didn't, didn't have a chance to do a, a sound check real well. Nobody was here before I got started. Um, so let's talk about the second assignment then. So, okay, great. So somebody says the sound sounds good here. That's good. So I think I've, I finally got my sound issues pretty much figured out. Um, if you have any questions, let me know, Just chat them out or shout them out. Um, so I think I'm going to go ahead and, um, talk about assignment two here. So. Um, as usual, if you've got your dev box open, the kind of first step when you want to work on an assignment um, is you have to first accept the assignment so that you'll get your repository. Right? So that's always the thing to do. Um, I'm going to copy that link so I can uh, do it over here. If you go to that particular URL, it should take you. Make certain that you are. Um, oh, yeah. So um, it won't give you the the option to select a new team or associate with an id usually after you've done that for the first time so you just accept the assignment and you'll be on your same team um, and associate with your same account once you've um, accepted the assignment 
So it should tray it for you. It usually doesn't take that long. So you should be able to just reload pretty quickly there. Um, and you'll have your link to your assignment too. By the way, I'm not certain if people, I mean, I've mentioned this before, but if you don't know how to find these, you know, if, if you haven't just created the link, if you go to your GitHub account, uh, the easiest way to do this is if you go to your organizations, because uh, basically this repository is created. So you might think it should be in your repositories, but you'll probably, you won't see it there because the repository is actually owned by the, my, the, the, the organization, the COSC 2336 DS um, algorithms um, uh, fall 2021, right? So to actually see the repository, you have to, you know, uh, click on the organization. And then when you're in there, you'll see the repositories that you create for this class to do the assignments that are actually owned by this organization, but you have access to them. So you have permissions to, to read and write them, right? So you should have your secure shell key set up already at this point. Um, which gives you the ability to actually push changes to the repository. So. Um, so as usual, I'm going to follow these steps. Before I follow these steps, let me mention uh, one or two things here. Um, let me go ahead and close off the examples here. Um, actually, uh, um, um, actually, I need to clone the repository. So, so okay, so I'm going to go ahead and start on, on the steps here. So again, every assignment you have to do these, there, there should always be a checklist here to kind of remind you. So, you know, you have to start by accepting the assignment invitation, which creates your repository in GitHub, which I just did. Um, you have to clone the repository. So let's get the repository here. Always make certain that you clone the SSH key, not, not the HTTPS key. So I'll just copy that. I'm going to go over here to my source control and clone repository and just paste the URL in there. And as usual, I'll put it in my sync um, assignment directory where I put all my assignments that I work on. And we'll go ahead and open it up when it prompts us to do that. So, um, and then once you've cloned it, make certain that you configure and confirm that everything can still build and run the tests. So, so you should never start doing stuff until. And, and there's one ex extra config, one extra check that I want, I want everybody to check that their um, uh, code formatting uh, and IntelliSense are set up as well. So let's do that. So, so basically, the once you get into once you get your repository cloned, um, assignment two in this case, we do have to run that configuration. So open up a, a terminal. If you've got the folder open with your repository, when you open up a terminal, you'll be in the assignment two. So you should be able to do the dot slash configure from there. So basically what this does is it configures the, the Visual Studio Code project. So you'll see that after you do this, it, it creates this VS Code subdirectory with all of our uh, configuration files. It also adds in the um, CLang format. So you should see these files over here um, if the configuration is set up correctly. Um, and once you've configured, you should be able to build everything. So you, know, you can do these from the command line. So you should be able to do a make clean, uh, make all, or just make, so by default, if you don't specify a target, it'll make everything. Um, and then make tests to actually run the unit test. So for assignment two, there's no test um, running yet. Like, like I think that was the same way for assignment one. So sometimes there might be some tests running initially, but um, sometimes not. Right? But you should see that, that um, um, something happens. You don't get an error message when you do that. All right, then, then to check that your configuration worked, uh, another kind of the next step, you might want to check that your keyboard bindings work. So if we open up, let's say, the, uh, the, the unit test file, um, you should be able to, to be able to use the keyboard uh, shortcut. So control shift one should do a make clean, control shift two should do the, the make all. 
and control shift three should do the make test to run the test, all right? Uh, and then finally, um, to make certain, um, let, let me remind about um, getting your IntelliSense set up. So some people still didn't have their IntelliSense set up um, correctly on assignment one. Um, so that was in a um, announcement here. So you might have to scroll down and find it. Uh, the announcement about the, the dev box issues. Um, So in particular, this one here, right? So I'm just gonna go ahead and do this again and show you. So um, if, so, so let me just show you what it should look like if you've got the right IntelliSense set up. So if you have IntelliSense set up, it should be reformatting. Uh, so one thing it should be doing is running the, the, the code formatter, which does the style checker and the, the, the source code formatter for you every, every time you save your file. So an easy way to check that is, um, let me just go ahead and uncomment a couple of things you can look for. So for example, um, um, we specify that, um, uh, well, first of all, I mean, all code should be indented to spaces, right? Uh, and then all opening curly braces should be on a line of their own, correctly indented. Um, and then some other things. So. Um, there should be a space like F be between keywords like if or else or for, um, and there should be spaces before and after binary operators. Um, oops. Right. So I'm, I'm just purposely on purpose. Um, putting in some code that's not formatted. So it's not correctly indented. Um, the, the curly braces aren't on the right place. Um, you know, we've got um, white, extra white space. We've got extra new lines. So you should never have more than like one new line um, in your code, right? So if your um, IntelliSense is set up and your project is configured correctly and the, um, the, the CLang formatter is running, it should format this to the correct class style uh, format when you do a save. So I'll just do control S or do a do a file save. So again, that's one of the configurations um, that it should run the, the, the code style checker um, on file saves, right? So notice when I did the save, um, it reformatted everything. So opening curly braces and closing curly braces are um, indented correctly. Uh, each opening curly brace is on a line of their own. Uh, we have no more than one blank line um, in a row separating code blocks. Uh, there, there's a space after keywords, like if keyword. Um, there's there's a, a blank space before and after binary operators um, and so on. It, it, it formats and checks a lot of other things, okay? But, but that's kind of a, a quick way to see if your style checker is working. Just uh, um, mess up some of your indentation or something um, and do a save, right? Um, it is possible that, that uh, the, the formatter is working, but your key bindings for some reason isn't working. So you should be able to always like um, right click and do like a format document or what is that, like control shift, um, boy, my eyesight's getting bad, I or something, whatever, keyboard shortcut. Um, and that'll run, that'll run, you know, that'll tell it to run the, um, the, the, the code style formatter for you. Okay. If that isn't working, um, either you haven't configured your project or you might not have um, you might not have your C++ IntelliSense working. Although if your C++ IntelliSense isn't, isn't working, um, you'll have a lot more issues than just the, your style checker isn't working. But uh, here, um, if, if you suspect this isn't working, you can always reinstall it. So I'm going to um, um, I'm going to uninstall. You should have. It looks like right for, for right now. You should have version 1.5.1 uh, installed. So so I'm going to get rid of that um, and reload it. So if you don't have IntelliSense installed. Um, If, um, 
Well, some, sometimes maybe it'll take a while before it figures it out, but some, you'll usually get messages about some things that um, are not configured. So um, anyway, so back to installing this. So to follow these directions, you have to first start by removing any uh, um, CPP tools files that's there. Uh, um, you should do this from your home directory. So right now I'm actually in the assignment to directory. So I'm gonna go ahead and close this um, project off, this folder off. So let's close the folder. So I don't have any folder op open. Now, if I open up a new terminal, um, uh, yeah, by default, it'll put you in your home directory. Okay, might be a good idea to learn a little bit of basic uh, Linux command line. So uh, here I'm just checking my current directory is my home vagrant. So, so we run as the vagrant user um, inside of your dev box here. So, so you might not have that file. Um, so I do have the file. So I'm going to go ahead and remove that because the the downloading the file um, will uh, not work if if you um, have that dot bsx bsix file um, in your directory here. And then this wget is really just downloading it. Uh, we have to use this from the command line because we don't have an easy way. I, I haven't set up like a way to secure shell in. So you can do like a file transfer into your uh, dev box. Oh, that, that's not true. So, I mean, as an alternative, you, you could download this um, on your host system and then just um, 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 and then just navigate, um, on, like for example, your file browser. So your, your, your files should be shared. So um, if, if, if I found that BSIX file on my host system and put it here, I should see it inside of my dev box. Okay, so that is actually another way you can do it. But I'm just going to do the wget command like um, I had um, in our announcement here. So I'll just copy this. And paste it. So that just downloaded it here um, inside of my dev box. So once it's inside my dev box, um, then I can do kind of the instructions that we had in, in the, uh, the practice assignment and elsewhere. So we can install it from that file. Um, and again, you can always, for this, for Visual Studio Code running in a browser like this, it, it, by doing a, a tab, a browser tab refresh, it actually kind of restarts Visual Studio Code. So here, um, if I want to make certain, I can, I can refresh the tab, which kind of restarts Visual Studio Code, uh, and I can see that this is installed now. So, and again, you should be looking for, I believe, the version that we need is the 1.5.1 right now as of the version of Visual Studio Code that I have you install in your dev box um, and stuff. So, all right. Any questions about that? Let me open up my assignment two again. So let's talk a little bit about that here for the, 30 minutes or so, see if people have questions, more specific questions about that, maybe. So, open that up. You have to kind of learn how to browse through here as well. So, you know, to find my folder, I need to start at my home directory. And then well, I always put the things, or I, if you follow my um, recommendations, I always put them in the sync assignment. I mean, you should have all your assignments uh, in here. All right, so, um, so yeah, I actually uncommented my first test case already. So let's, um, so now if I try and do a build, uh, we're not gonna be building because um, we're expecting the is empty function here, right?
I don't know if I mentioned this outline before, but uh, maybe I'll show using that here. Um, all right, so let's, let's look at the assignment two. So once you've completed the checklist, you should be ready to start working on the task. So as usual, um, um, I suggest that you start by uncommenting that. Um, and um, and then just getting um, um, the um, the code to compile and run. Okay, so there's actually what well, there's actually a couple of test cases all for task one. Um, so the, these are encouraging you to try and get the stub functions up for task one one by one. But you actually have to create three stub functions, uh, so, so three functions that really don't do anything except for return a default value, okay? And I'll go ahead and give you the first one here. Um, so for, for this, but... Um, but, but basically, I wanted you to get these, these four stub functions working. I called that task one before you actually... Uh, implement a function. So in task two, uh, you're going to be actually implementing add item. And then while you're implementing add item, you're going to be uh, implementing sort of incrementally um, these other functions that we did here. So we did it that way because um, um, these make good things that we can use to test that you are implementing add item correctly. So, so we kind of wanted to implement these in parallel to adding features into the add item function here. All right. So let me go ahead. Um, and is empty is supposed to? It's a function. It's a member function um, of of of, a, of the set class here. So maybe I should step back and kind of give an overview of some things. Um, and it's it's returning a Boolean result. So it returns just true or false. Uh, the set is empty or not. True that the set is empty or false that the set is not empty. All right. so, um, for this unit, for this class, um, we're going to be implementing um, a class this time. Right, so when you look in the header file, you'll see that there's a declaration of a class called set. Right, so and again, you need to kind of watch, go through the, the, the materials this week about structures and classes. So, so basically, the, the purpose of this assignment is we're going to implement the set class. This adds a new data type to the language, you know, so, so like uh, integers or floats. Uh, we want to add um, the ability to define variables of type set. Um, and, and this set is like the, the mathematical set. So the, the set contains items in the set um, and, and it contains unique items, right? So if, if we add, and, and we're just doing a simple set here, so we can only uh, represent sets of integer values, right? So a more realistic set, we want to be able to be able to have like sets of strings or sets of floats or sets of other things, right? But to begin with, um, we just have sets of integers. But so if our set contains the integer values one, five, and seven, if we try to add, say, another five, uh, it would only keep one unique um, value of, of each item in the set, all right? So anyway, I hope everybody's, you know, kind of knows, is, is familiar with the, the concept of a set from mathematics. So that's what we're trying to implement. So um, we're going to be actually using an array of integers, all right? So, so these are actually member variables like we talked about um, in our um, videos and lecture materials for this unit this week, right? So we've got an array. Uh, we actually have a maximum size. So we can only represent sets of up to 100 items by doing this. So this is what's known as initializing an array statically right so that that makes that, that puts a limitation so if somebody actually wanted to use our set they couldn't represent you know they, they, they couldn't use it to represent very big sets 
So as soon as, as, soon as you hit 100 values, um, if you try to add another value, you'd be in trouble um, with our set here. Um, next unit, next week, we're going to talk about dynamically allocating memory and dynamically allocating arrays, which is a way to fix this. So that if I need to represent a set of 1,000 um, in like a class like this, I could just dynamically allocate an array of the size that I need. So, uh, but even though we can represent sets of up, up to 100 items, but initially our sets are going to be empty. Um, so initially the set size is going to be zero and there are going to be no items in our array of integers. So no items in our set, all right? Um, and and I, I gave you the uh, constructor. So there's a constructor already for this class. Um, so if you look at the constructor, let me open up. So, so the actual implementation of our set is um, is um, separate from the um, uh, the declaration, right? So again, once again, the, the declaration of things goes in the header file. So we just declare the set, oops, and um, um, the, the, we declare our class, our set class. Uh, we declare what member variable it has. We declare the the functions, the member functions that it has. But these are like function prototypes or function signatures. So this is just the declaration. It's not the implementation. And then we have the actual implementations over in the set.cpp file. So that's the implementation file here. All right. So now, if you look at it, the the only file that the only member function that's implemented is the constructor. Okay. So the constructor is called whenever you uh, create a new instance, you know, a new variable of type set. So in this case, all we do is we set the initial set size to be zero. Right. So notice we don't have to do anything special. There's a member variable called set size. So in our constructor, we just set our set size to zero. Right. So again, this is all talked about um, in our materials for the class this week. Um, um, just as an example of that, so our very first uh, test case here, Notice, so this is what we mean by we're adding a new data type to the language. So just like I can declare variables of type integer or float or character, right? Once you add a new data type using a class or a structure to the C++ language, you can declare variables of that type. So, so it's like I'm extending the language to add new data types. Um, by convention, uh, we use a, a initial capital letter to indicate a user-defined data type. That's one of the class style, that, although that's not enforced by the class style checker, but um, but everything that's like a structure or a class, you should use an initial uppercase character to, to indicate that this is a user-defined data type rather than a built-in data type, like an int float or character here. All right. And the other thing that I was going to get at is that, you know, when you declare a variable of type set, uh, it calls the constructor. OK, so, you know, we talk about this in the lecture videos for this week. So basically my set called S when I create it here um, has a member variable called um, dot set size. And it was initialized to zero. OK, but. You know, as we talked about in our videos, uh, because set size is private, um, I can't actually do this because it's a private member variable, so I can't actually access private things. And you can see if your IntelliSense is set up correctly, um, you'll get the red squigglies because it's telling you that um, uh, that it's inaccessible because it, it's it's a private variable. So so it's not something that. Uh, only only members of you know member functions of my set class can access directly the set size to like set it or, or you know change it or whatever. Um, I, I can't do that outside of a member function for my set here. 
but that's what the constructor is for. So the constructor initializes the set to be initially empty for us by setting the set size. All right. Questions about that? All right, so let's get that to compile. Um, so I'll give you this first one. Um, so here again, you know, we're, we're adding in uh, signatures for member functions. So, so like you did for the, assign, the assignment one and the practice assignment, um, this is really like a signature, but it's, it's a, the signature of a member function. So it's, it's a member of the set class because we're putting it in between the open and colon, uh, open and closing curly braces uh, for the set class here. So everything in between there is members, member variables or member functions of our set class. All right, so, um, so as I believe I talked about um, in our videos this week, um, uh, is empty, if you call is empty, it's just finding out and returning information about the class. So it doesn't actually modify the class. It doesn't, you know, like it's not like add item where we're adding a new item into our set, which actually changes the set. So whenever you have functions that are just returning information, getting information about the class, they should be declared as constant functions. That's an indication that um, it's a constant member function, all right? So you can't declare a regular functions in C to be constant functions, but member functions can be constant functions like this if they don't modify the, the, the class when you call them. All right, so that's that's a requirement of um, of um, this function of, of the is empty function. So I, I didn't add my issues yet here. Um, so let's go ahead and add my task one issue. Now I've been thinking about it. So. So just kind of as a hint, I mean, you know, um, this will usually be the, the, these kind of requirements will usually be described um, in the um, assignment um, um, description. Uh, but yeah, I mean, you know, this is a lot of text, so sometimes you can miss things. So um, often, the um, if there are particular requirements, uh, they will be uh, summarized in the, uh, the the issues, right? So in this case, all of these sub functions for task one are, are required to be constant member functions. Uh, here, they're all just returning information. Yeah. All right. So once we add the, the, the prototype for our member function, um, um, we're still not quite done. So, so this will actually allow um, um, if I remove um, unused variables, this will actually allow the, um, the test file to compile, uh, but we won't be able to link together because we haven't written an implementation yet. So this is actually a link error because um, something's trying to call is empty, um, and we've said that there should be a, a function called is empty implemented somewhere, but there's no actual implementation yet, right? So, you know, I, I gave you, I, I think for the next assignment, you're going to have to start writing this function documentation yourself. But again, for assignment two, I gave you the function documentation, but make certain that you put your implementation um, in the correct place associated with the function documentation. So this is the, this is the location where is empty uh, function should go to, right? Well, initially, sets should be empty, um, and our first test is, is um, checking that um, uh, if we ask for the set S that we don't add any items into, um, it should um, um, 
return true that that the set is empty right now um, after we create it for the first time so. oh so another thing here though so here um if we're defining functions that are member of, of the set class we're, if we're implementing them so here it, it's complaining because you're not allowed to add constant because i haven't declared this function to be a member of a class. This looks to the compiler right now as just a regular function, a regular C function, right? And regular C functions can't be constant. It doesn't make sense. Uh, constant only makes sense for member functions. You know, it's a function that doesn't modify the class, right? So that's telling me that um, I forgot to declare it to be a member of the set class. So the, the set colon colon, um, anything when you're doing the implementation for a member function, you have to tell it in the implementation file that, oh yeah, by the way, this function is actually a member of the set um, namespace or of the set class. That's kind of what the set colon colon syntax is doing here. So that should now allow us to build, hopefully, and now we've actually got a test. So if I run the test, I'll see that we're running one test and passing it. Okay. All right. Um, so that's probably all the code I'm going to give you, but. Um, uh, we'll see if there's any questions from those who've, who are here live. Um, uh, I'll go through the rest of these tasks then. So, um, so, so I kind of gave you the first one. I mean, you basically have to do the same thing for the other three functions here. So get set size. Um, so, you know, the set can be empty or not, but then uh, you might also want to ask, okay, um, how many items are actually in the set? You know, uh, are there zero? So when, when the set is empty, get set size will just return zero. You know, if I've added five items, then get set size should return five. Okay, so get set size again, it doesn't take any input parameter, but it returns an integer. Right. Um, and in this case, um, I mean, just as a hint, you know, how are you going to implement? How are you going to implement? Actually, implement is empty and get set size. Well, yeah, you're going to rely on the set size member variable. So get set size is actually the easiest of these first four constant uh, information um, um, accessor methods, because all you have to do is return the current set size. So set size should be initialized to zero, uh, but every time you add an item, you're going to have to uh, increment the set size to, to keep track, or every time you remove an item, you have to decrement the set size. So set size Member variables should always be keeping track of what the current number of items is, what the, what the current set size is. So you can just return that for the get set size. Right. Uh, now contains item um, is gonna, uh, gonna return a Boolean. So it's gonna be true or false, but uh, unlike the first two functions, uh, you have to pass in a parameter here. So you have to pass in an integer value, which you need to search the set and see if that item that's asked for is actually in the set or not, All right? So again, if that doesn't quite make sense, you can look at the, um, the test case for how we use it. So when you call contains item, you pass in an integer value, right? And, and the idea is that when you call that member function, it returns true or false. So, and, and initially, you know, if the set is empty, like it is when we created the set, I mean, it shouldn't contain any item. So it should be returning false. If we have, okay, does it contain five? False, no. Does it contain three? No, that's false. And so, right. again, this should be a constant member function because it's just returning information. And get set size should be a constant member function. It's just returning information. Um, and then finally, the string method. You want we want to represent um, um, 
the, the contents of the set as a string. So you need to create a string using a string stream um, and return that string, okay? Um, although initially, um, if you want to for the stub function, you don't really even have to create a, a string stream yet. So for the stub function, uh, so notice there's, there's actually a blank space in here. So be careful of that, but, but like for your stub function, you could do something as simple as return just a, 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 a constant, a, a string constant, right? So if you return that from your stub function, uh, that would be enough to satisfy the initial test case here, okay? But ultimately, um, So we'll talk more about um, the, the string member function. So here is what it's supposed to look like. So after we add the first item to our set, so this is for unit, this is for task two here, uh, where we're beginning to implement the add item function. But uh, so after you add, add um, a five, if you call the, the string method, um, you should get a string that looks like this, which has five in there, right? Because we've got one item in our set and that item is the, the integer five. Right? So you can use a string stream um, to construct a string and return it here. I talked about that in our lecture videos this week and um, I believe, and, and last week too, I think. Um, all right, so, so yeah, this is the beginning of task two. So for the beginning, for task two, um, you're gonna actually implement the add item member function, uh, but in order to, um, to get all these tests to pass, uh, we have to actually give real implementations for the, um, the stub functions as well. All right, so if that's not clear, so like looking at this first test here, as soon as we add five, uh, the set is no longer empty, right? So to get this test to pass, um, you need to be returning false instead of true, right? So if, if you're returning true initially, just to get this to pass, uh, it won't work anymore. Um, um, at this point, because we're expecting it to return false after we've added our first item, right? So I already mentioned, so how do you, how do you, I think I already mentioned, so how do you actually implement is empty? Uh, what you should be using is the set size. So if the set size is zero, then you should be returning true. The set is empty. And if, if the set size is greater than zero, if it's non-zero, um, then you should be returning false, right? Um, and you know, get set size should be trivial. So um, um, just returning the current set size member variable should implement correctly set size as long as you're correctly incrementing set size whenever you add an item here. You change item. Um, um, is um, the toughest one to implement, I think, here uh, among these, right? So to get this to work, what you need to do um, is you need to actually add in the correct implementation implementation to your add item member function to add the item to your set items and also to increment the set size. All right. So how do you do that? Well, basically, you can think of sets. We're we're using the set size here to do a double purpose in this class. So, so set size might not be a, a, a real great name because it's both the set size, but it's also used as an index into the set items array, right? So initially when the, when the um, set is empty, set size will be zero. But when you add your first item, what you want to do is you wanna add that item to index zero. Remember arrays in C++, like you should have reviewed last week, um, our index starting at zero. 
So when we add five to our set, we want to add a five to index zero of our set items and then increment set size by one so that it's now one. Um, so that the next add item will get added to index uh, one of set item, right? So that is in a nutshell, nutshell is the how you implement the basics of um, the add item. Um, so, you know, if you add the item to the array and you increment the set size, and then you correctly um, fix the implementations for is empty, get set size, and contains item. So for contains item, then you actually have to search the array, right? So you're gonna have to, to write a loop for contains item um, that, that goes from index zero up to the number of items in, in the set. Set size, and it looks at each item in the, in the uh, array. And if it's the item that we're looking for, right, does it contain five? So we're, we're basically you're gonna be searching your array of items to see if it contains the item five or not. And if you ever find the item, you should return true. Um, and then, yeah, in this case, you know, zero shouldn't be in the set yet. We didn't add a, a zero to our set. So, so now if you search again, it, it should fail to find the item. So if, if you search all the items in the array and you don't find it, you should return false. Kind of as the default, um, you know, when you fail the search. All right, and then finally, um, uh, again, you should use the uh, an O string stream. So, so again, I think I have this in some of the example code for the videos this week, but you can create an O string stream. Um, uh, uh, so that's a type that's added whenever you include the S stream uh, library. So um, um, I should have been, I probably already included it for you in set.cpp. So we've already included S stream for the string streams. Um, um, so, you know, this is a variable like, um, 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 so you can give it a name, like, um, um, so it would be a good name for this um, set string or something like that. And then once you have this, you can use this just like C out, but, but, but this will uh, put things into a stream. So you can do things like, like that to get the, the initial opening um, square bracket in there. And then you'll have to have a loop to add in all of the items of the set. And then you have to have another one to close it off. Uh, and then this, th this is actually an O string stream. Um, so, but you, you need to return an actual string. So to do that, you can convert one of these O string streams into a regular C++ string. So if you just return, um, if you just call the member method string um, and return that, that will actually return what's what's being expected here um, from your member function, which is, you know, we're actually expecting a regular string here, not, not an O string string. All right, and then I'm going to wrap up. Although we still got Thursday, you know, so um, you know um, um, that people could ask more questions about things. I suspect maybe I'll have more questions by Thursday um, on things. So, so um, for the um, task three, so actually, you know, again, this is a mathematical set. So, uh, if I mean, you need to implement. For task two, the add item, the way it's described, but but the add item, the way it's described, has a bug, because we need to make certain that, like, if I add a five, and then if I later on, so here I add the items five, nine, negative one, and forty-two to my set. So if I try to add a duplicate, so if I try to add another five to my set, basically, you know, the the it should be ignored. Okay, so you should only keep one unique value of each item in your set. That's what a mathematical set is, right? So to fix that bug, so um, if, 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 um, 
if you don't fix this, you'll end up with, um, you know, so after adding, trying to add a duplicate five, the set size should still be four. So basically nothing should happen, all right? So, so how do you implement that? So this is described, but, but this, this is actually a, should be a pretty quick task for most people. Uh, you are required to reuse um, the um, contains item. So basically what you do is um, for add item, you first are gonna to, to use, you're gonna first check whether it contains the item or not. So every time add item is called, first say, uh, if it contains the item, you just return immediately without doing anything. So you just ignore the request to add a duplicate item. Otherwise, then, then if it doesn't contain the item already, go ahead and do what you implemented already in task two to, to add the item to the end of the array and to increment um, the, uh, the set item. Or the, the set size, increment the set size. All right, and then um, test four. Um, we need to implement the remove item. Okay, so set wouldn't be very useful if we could only add items. Um, so, so often, you know, we want to remove items. So basically to do this, it's a little bit tougher than add item because when you remove an item, we don't want to leave holes in that array. So, I mean, there, there's two basic ways you could implement a removal like this, you could put it like a special value in a hole. So the next time you add an item, you might fill in a hole, but that has its own problem. So what we, what, what you're required to do for this assignment is instead, when you remove an item, you have to first search and, and, and find the location of that item. And once you find the item that needs to be removed, you want to shift everything down by one. Um, so, so basically instead of leaving a hole in the array, you're going to shift all items that are above that down one position in the array and then um, decrement the set size by one once you do that. So that's the remove item. Um, and then when you get to um, the, the, the task five and six, there's six tasks this time, uh, make certain before you do task five that you uncomment this text, test fixture. Um, it's used in task five and six. So um, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna not talk about these today. Uh, maybe I'll talk more about these on Thursday or if people send questions about these, but uh, the, the, the most basic operation for a set uh, is set union and set intersection. So task five is to add the, uh, an operator, a union operator or a union operation for the set so that we can compute uh, and, and create the union between a set one and set two different sets, set one and set two in this case. Um, there are multiple test cases now for, so for task five, there's, there's like four, three or four test cases. So make certain that, um, when you're testing operator union, you, you check all these more than four, maybe five. And then finally for, uh, task six is the operator intersect. Okay. So the union of two sets is going to be uh, a new set, uh, um, or in this case, actually we're modifying the, the, the set that we call the operator on. So for, for the union set one will end up having all the values that are in either set one or set two, that's the union. And for the intersect, uh, if we do the intersect between set one and set two, uh, set one will end up with only the values that are in both set one and set two when we call the operation um, on it, okay? So that's the intersect. And again, make certain, you know, you uncomment all five or six of these test cases. Although um, I think I described this in the assignment script. So what you wanna do is first only uncomment the first test case, get those to work for the operator union and the operator intersect. And once you have these working, um, I think that probably most likely everything else will work, but, but yeah, just get those working first and then un uncomment the others and check that all the rest of these work. All right, so any quick questions on that? It is um, time for me to sign off uh, for this session. So we still have one more session uh, on Thursday before the um, 
assignment two is due. Um, but uh, you know, you can send me questions in the meantime on this, your questions about the materials this week um, as you prepare for the, uh, the second uh, quiz on Wednesday. Last chance for questions here. Um, if not, then I'm going to go ahead and end the session and I'll post it as usual to our YouTube uh, playlist for the class help sessions. Uh, keep working on assignments, keep sending the questions, uh, and I'll see you guys all later then.